uh, we are also hoping together with Andreas to uh, propose uh, a challenge really for the ASEAN uh, region in the next coming fund. So I'm hoping that's gonna fly through as well because you know, I think they've just forgotten us really. There's so much for Africa already, Angela, but we haven't got anything for uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah, and this is the place, this is definitely the place to work on that. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, who else would like to introduce themselves? I, myself, uh, my name is Shem from Singapore. I uh, was invited by uh, Jan Tirta to come in into this community to understand what it's about. So this is my first session. Uh, nice to meet you all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Angela. As I said, I'm coming in from Eastern Africa. I've actually been joined by my mom, Anne Wanjiro Gatende. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name's uh, in caps. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, I'm shouting my name. I'm Anne. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, we did put in some proposals in Fund 7 and um, we are waiting for the voting and we look forward to East Africa being um, participating in this and being actively involved in this. So we look forward to working with you guys. Nice to meet you all. Perfect, who's next? Let's get to know each other. Uh, sure, then I'll go next. Um, hello, I'm, I'm Simon. I'm from Austria. I'm participating in Catalyst for um, yeah about a year now. Um, and I'm involved in different projects like the Catalyst School and uh, Katana for Climate. And also I've been involved here uh, a little bit. And yeah, great to get to know you all. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Robert, hi. You're joining us from New Zealand. You're my co-host. Uh... Yeah, so uh, I didn't really introduce myself fully in uh, the uh, main room there, but uh, I'm Robert O'Brien uh, from New Zealand. I live in the North Island of our country. At the moment, it's summer and uh, been a bit too hot for my liking uh, <laughs> over the last few moments. But I've been in the Catalyst for several years, uh, well, Karano for several years in Catalyst since the, the very beginning. Uh, um, and obviously had various different proposals up on being funded in uh, Fund 6 to do uh, some work around a new type of market mechanism. I spend most of, well, I try to spend most of my days writing software. I don't succeed in doing that all the time, uh, but that's what I try to do. Uh, so I'm very familiar with all the blockchain space, quite a lot of stuff. And if you let me, I'll talk your head off. Uh, so <laughs> be warned, don't let me do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. Um, Who would like to go next? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Evans Kisanga. I'm from Tanzania, East Africa. I'm a proposer in FAM7, member of Catalyst community, also a community advisor. Um, looking forward to collaborate with anyone who needs collaboration. I'll cooperate with you. Thank you. Thanks, Evans. Um, Yoram, you've already had a go. Would you like another? Yeah, I mean, quick one. So, uh, Yoram, I'm involved um, in Catalyst since June, uh, last year, June, July, actually. Um, I have some proposals, a lot about sustainability and impact and transparency for impact in this uh, type of areas. Uh, very active with Cardano for Climate. Uh, you're all welcome to join us there as well, which is kind of a community that is focusing on uh, blockchain solutions for, for climate change. Um, relevant for everyone. So welcome to join us. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to pick on Felix. <laughs> Say hey. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone. Felix here, calling from South of France. I'm Cardano Ambassador, founder of the Catalyst Swarm, leading this initiative as well. 
initiated some other stuff like bridge builders, the ambassadors guild, or NFT guild coming up. And I would describe myself as bridge builder and community architect, something like this. But mostly here to connect people to ensure that we have as community open places to come to each other, speak with each other, and then build impactful projects with each other, right? And very happy to have you all here. Anyone else? Want Is he breaking to... up? Can anyone else hear him? Hi, Hi everyone. Hi. Do you hear me? Yes. Well, I'm from Argentina, currently living in Spain, in, in Barcelona. Um, honestly, I don't know if I'm in the right place. Um, I, I, I do like the part of Cardano a lot. I'm highly invested in Cardano. I'm not participating in any catalyst. I just wanted to get some insights. So, um, well, just that. I mean, uh, I just want to hear about you, what you're doing, how you're participating in the project, and get some, out, get some ideas. Cool. Oh, and you, Juan. I will point you in, happy to have you here, but I will point you in another direction because in some weeks we have the Latin American town hall coming up now. So there's a bunch of folks from Peru, Argentina, Chile, Brazil coming together, setting up a whole town hall in Spanish and Portuguese. Fair enough, sure. So you can even speak in your, in your language. So, uh, Paris, where is it taking place? I will link you to the to the direction. Don't worry. I will send you some links here in the Zoom live chat. All right. Thanks. Yeah, but but generally you're in the right place if you just want to find out and learn about things and and try and figure things out. If you've got any questions, that's largely what the space is about, right? Um, and really just to get to know people. So whether it's here or in the Latin American um, or the, you know, other sort of uh, time zones, there's a similar sort of events going on. And we're really just here to try and uh, both learn from everyone, each other, in terms of what local needs are, what, what uh, aspirations, what thing problems you're trying to find and try and help people actually navigate around the whole catalyst. Uh, space in the Cardano space generally and more broadly the blockchain space. Um, so that's what we're here for. So you're in the right place. Definitely. And and don't get me wrong, huh? I don't want to say, hey, no, no, go back off. <laughs> you're in the wrong end. But not, not at all. Very happy to have you. I don't think we've heard from Regina or Vinay Would he, or, or John. Have we heard from John? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm John. I'm a proposer of Fund Seven, and uh, I have um, proposed the anime, an Asian anime NFT game last time. I'm looking to collaborate with other game makers out there. Thank you. Where about you coming in again from, John? Is it Singapore or Hong Kong? Oh, um, I'm, I reside in London, but I'm originally okay. from Taiwan. Okay. Cool. That's right. Um, Regina or Finlay? Oh, you're on mute. Vig Regina, Regina, you're on mute. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Regina Makongo and happy new year to you all. Yeah, um, I'm am Frank Seven proposer and also I'm um, director of the uh, RFFXCD company limited. Yeah, that's all for today. I just want to, to listen today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, Vinay. Hello, everyone. I'm from Hi. India. So we have put in close to seven proposals in Project Catalyst 7. So we are a big team. We are almost a team of 20 members. So we are uh, working on a project called Conma. So we are building it. Uh, so we're going to be a sidechain 
on cardano so we are closely working with m labs and uh, iohk and emergo india so yeah we are we are just waiting for uh, we are really excited about uh, the voting and uh, the results so we are just waiting for that As i saw you guys presenting in the tower in the idea fest you had i think yeah. seven or eight presentations <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Seven. Yes. So, how do you find them? I think it's so great to we, see. So we need your input. Very interesting. Yes. Um, we are it was a very interesting. Yeah, it was very very interesting, very inspiring. Um, you looked at the whole ecosystem, yeah. all the way to the front end to the trade. It's amazing. You've thought it through. So quite fundamentally amazing so looking thank forward you. to seeing what what can come out of it. yeah that was very interesting thank you thank you first in touch with your project as community advisor checking dow proposals and it's like wow there are a lot of conma conma india is it a spam checking it ah okay no it's not a spam wow cool there's a whole initiative in india building up cool because indian project community is not presented as at all in Kalama. so really happy that you thrive in as flagship and maybe inspiring other in uh, people from india as well to join the ecosystem and community so we were building we were planning to build on ethereum but then no, once after we heard uh, don taps got uh, on the cardano summit so we wanted to do dcf Uh, so that is when we got in touch with IOHK and IOHK was like, uh, DCF is too early as in like, it's still in the oven baking. So probably by mid next year is when you can see DCF. So that is when we heard, as in they told us about project catalyst and then we immediately got to catalyst and yeah, we, we had like close to seven proposals. Just wondering, Simon, if you wanted to, Give a, since you've dropped in here, give us a little update on we yourself and where you're where you're in from, coming in from and how your uh, thinking is evolving. Yes, thank you. So sorry for being late. I had internet problems. Uh, so um, um, actually, so I mean, regarding the project, not not much has evolved i guess so we're like uh, but i have found like a, a few more uh, team members um who are very excited about the project who are also uh, with me here uh, working like uh, during during the week so that i'm very happy about because they're very very passionate about the project and um and um and uh, we've uh, started reaching out to like different uh, community members and creators um, who want to like pilot um, um, and uh, so that's what we've been doing so like reaching out to people and uh, yeah and and um, yeah so that's I guess mainly it yeah yeah I was just wondering um, Angela if you could uh, if you would give us a sort of um, overview of what's happening in the East African community I'd uh, be quite interested to hear what's going on because I know quite a bit has been happening. Yeah, it's going really, really well. So I uh, came in to the Eastern Town Hall um, early October and I was so, so uh, happy that Robert would have me and Felix would have me in their, um, <laughs> their own proposal, which is why we're all sitting here. Um, we're all here because of their work. And um, I decided to work in the countries of Eastern Africa, all the way from South Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea, Kenya, Uganda, Mozambique. Sorry, my geography. <laughs> uh, Uganda, Burundi, uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, as Evans and um, Regina are joining us from Tanzania. And we are open to working with anyone from Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, yeah. Eastern Mozambique Congo. and Eastern Congo. Oh, Eastern Congo also, the Goma region. Um, 
Maybe I let's say East Africa. Africa. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so what's been going on is we have, as a collective, been able to put together 26 proposals. Um, quite a few of them, the proposals are sitting in this room and we would really appreciate your support in any way that you can during the voting period. Thank you. Cool. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Juan or if, uh, sorry, is it Nori, I, can, I can't quite pronounce your name here, Nori. So you can help. just uh, call me uh, Shem. Shem. Last... Right. Shem, yeah. I, I was wondering if, um, because uh, both of you are new here, uh, everyone else is sort of uh, a little bit familiar, they've at least been here once before. So I'm curious as to what sort of questions you have. Um, you're obviously trying to understand a little bit about Catalyst, uh, about Cardano, those sort of things. Do you have any particular questions that you think we could uh, have a go at trying to answer or think about for you or that you want to know? Or do you just want to sit in behind the scenes and just listen? Um, for me, uh, because I've been invited in by uh, the Indonesian uh, friend uh, he just asked me to sit in and uh, observe what it's about and I can ask him more questions uh, later on uh, but maybe just one question into this uh, room I just wanted to know what uh, does uh, what is the overview of this uh, catalyst is all about is it about project building or, or fundraising uh, that's my only question for for now okay so yeah. sort of what is Catalyst and how does it fit into the broad picture of things, basically, uh, what's going yeah. on? Yeah. Well, yeah. Juan, do you, what sort of questions might you have? Well, more or less the same. I mean, um, what you guys are doing here is just getting to know each other, trying to get any help from, from someone else, um, exposure to your projects, to the things you're working at. I mean, um I, I i don't expect you to like to use this this place to educate me i mean um it's lots of information outside but just to i would just prefer to stay in the behind you know in the yeah. shadows and listen to you all and try to learn something from you just that okay yeah i just thought i'd ask I'd ask those questions first of all so that we've got a sense of uh what people are wanting to get out of uh what we cover off in this room in the next hour or two uh and what sort of topics are particularly of interest to anyone and so i was wondering also if there's any particular topics that people wanted to cover today in particular uh, that might be of interest to them so um you know what sort of things would you like to uh, are on your mind uh, would you like discussed or anything has anyone else got sort of questions so i've just got a sort of sense of what we can cover and direct what's going on anything? i think it would be cool if we could cover the basics of voting uh, and how one goes about voting okay. yep anything else Nothing else? Okay, we'll, we'll wing it as we go along as we do so pretty much all the time. So I think um, just briefly to give you a picture, um, so everyone's on at least the same page, what is Catalyst and what is it that we're doing here? Uh, and the broader question is how does um, Catalyst fit with respect to Cardano? And how does it fit with respect to the, the wider sort of notions of blockchains and how we use them is kind of quite important. Um, so I was wondering, Angela, would you like to have a go at like that or do you want me to try and do it? Or does someone else want to have a try and have a go at trying oh, to sure, explain? sure. Go, go. So as we just heard in the main session, Project Catalyst is an experiment. We were welcomed to the experiment. And the experiment is all about um, uh, Charles Hoskinson and his team have dared us to change the world. Felix, you have a question? Uh, no, or no, a comment? Go for, go, oh no, go for it. Yeah, cool. Um, 
So Project Catalyst is an assembly of people of different qualifications from different countries, all coming together to write proposals and, and propose how they could change their area of the world. Um, we are sitting, as I said earlier, in the Eastern Town Hall, which was uh, a proposal made by Felix and team. Um, so this is an example that we've all gathered here because uh, they were able to win a proposal. So there are three or four, Robert, um, funds in a year, three? Four. Four, <laughs> sorry, four funds in a year. <laughs> And we are in the middle, um, near the end of fund seven. The whole system started, Project Catalyst system started in September, 2020. And it will continue going on until we uh, change the world. So this is why things may break, things may uh, differ between iterations, things may change on you. Um, but we're all here to support you on your journey and we are here to see what the blockchain can do um, for us and for others. Felix, go right ahead. And maybe to um, wrap up Catalyst in a really easy, fast sense. Catalyst is nothing else than Angela mentioned already. It's an experiment, an experiment to figure out how the community builds access and use cases for the Cardano treasury, which is currently about $1 billion. We are distributing each three months a certain amount of funds to the community. And those funds now are rewarded, forwarded, distributed to the community to identify problems, submit solutions to those problems, and vote on the problems all made by the community. And everything what is Catalyst now is depends on the experience you bring in because Catalyst itself establishes and explores itself along the way by the community, which means everything what we see today is as it is today. Catalyst might be something totally else in a half a year from now and one year from now. The philosophy of Catalyst is evolve over iterations. So each three months, funds are coming. We look back on the funding round, adjust, optimize along the way, and build the experience, build the system, build the protocol step by step together with the community. It's also a very first attempt for the entities who control Cardano right now, Emergo, IoT, and Cardano Foundation, to step away as a custodian and to handle over the whole ownership and the whole decision making process to the community itself. And that's what we are doing here. It's not only submitting proposals, it's all it's building governance. Digital government. Uh, a little bit addition to that, uh, we also aim at uh, attaining highest level of human collaboration, whereby people from different places in the world we try to collaborate to build the ecosystem, to build, uh, to improve our, to improve our, our lives in general, also to improve the blockchain ecosystem as well. So we collaborate. So feel free to collaborate in any project or talk to anybody from a different place from where you are if you see there's any potential that you could collaborate. I was wondering yeah, if anyone I, else. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like to say to, to new people normally in a simple way that it, I call it a decentralized incubator, okay, of ideas. So sometimes it's very difficult to understand anything unless you start spending time. So I say it's a decentralized incubator of, of uh, a decentralized incubator that we being built, you know, all the infrastructure how to manage a decentralized incubator, governance, treasury, all of that around that. And um, anyway, that's uh, that's an easy way that I try to explain it to to newcomers. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to to you guys, but uh... I I think. Um... I'm interested to hear what, how everyone thinks about it, to be honest, um, because it, it's like uh, there's a sort of adage around um, the blind men and the elephant, and everyone's sort of plugging in different parts of it and trying to figure out what things are. Um, you know, one calls the legs, the tree trunk, and so on. And, and in many respects, we don't know what Catalyst is. 
So our own articulations and our own uh, imaginations of what it is are quite important. So I'm interested to know what other people think um, in the room here. Anyone else want to offer an opinion on what is Catalyst? Because we all learn from doing that. Um, also giving back power to the individual. Um, having been in um, countries or organizations where you have to be in very complex scenarios for you to be able to launch a proposal or a call for a, for a proposal has to have been made for you to be able to respond to it, um, an expression of interest. There's so much you have to do in order for you to just propose an idea. And, and what inspired me the most about this was uh, just listening to Charles Hoskinson saying, pick up a shovel and <laughs> just, just do something, you know, um, wherever it is you are as an individual, whatever project you think um, the blockchain can somehow unlock for you. And the simplicity with which you can just enter in um, for me is, is, a big, is a big game changer. The fact that the individual can enter in um, and be incubated and be able to actually put out an idea and have a safe space in a community that looks at your idea and says, okay, yes, could you work with this one? Could you change it here a little bit? Could you? So just having also that um, your ideas being looked at by many people and many people helping you to make your idea better, to improve the idea and so that it can be very effective for wherever it is you are. So it's a great opportunity. I consider it an opportunity for the individual to express themselves with, in spaces where they may not have been able to. As um, Vinay, given that you've got seven proposals up, how do you view uh, Catalyst? What is Catalyst to you? Are you asking me? Uh, to Vinay. I was just wondering if Vinay has got uh, what he thinks it is. So I would, I would say it's a platform where, uh, as in, again, uh, about Project Catalyst, we just got to know the day Project Catalyst 7, as in Fund 7 started. We haven't uh, been watching this space. Uh, we got to know about it and we felt really nice. We were like, okay, it's a funding mechanism where we can at least like bridge the gap. Our aim was to get to DCF where it is much more of a bigger fund where uh, it's a consortium of multiple uh, institutions coming together uh, but we didn't want to like uh, waste time till next year mid so we thought uh, we'll just give it a try but then when we got there we, we just met the community and uh, the whole team was like impressed with how the whole sessions run and week on week every Wednesday night again uh, when it comes to our timings right so we have to wait till like 11 30 in the night to attend all our sessions so week on week, we felt like really nice when the inside sharing session happened. Uh, it was great. Then for two weeks, we were like just uh, refining and uh, preparing our proposals. So it, it was great fun as in we met like a lot of people. Again, I met Dimitri. Dimitri is someone again, uh, uh, he joined us right now. So he's from Sri Lanka. So I think like I made like a lot of friends, uh, a lot of collaborations. Now we have like team everywhere around the world. Now uh, our first uh, developer is from Guatemala. So yeah, it, it, it feels nice. It's, it's like a family. Cool. Um, John, uh, given that you're uh, looking at uh, doing, you, you're working on a game, uh, in this whole space. Can you share a little bit of insight in terms of what it represents to the, the gaming industry? What does Catalyst to you represent to you and how does that reflect in terms of the gaming industry? John? I just want, is he there? He's not there. I'll ask that question again when he when he's around. Um, but I'll follow on also in terms of people's trying to understand what's going on. Uh, since we've got Yoram and Simon here, um, I'm interested to know how you view 
uh, this from a climate and the UN sustainability goal point of view. And what does, how does Catalyst fit into those uh, big high level goals? Okay, excellent question. <laughs> so I, I uh, Simon, I jump in, so I'm sorry, you can jump after. But um, <laughs> we see it as an opportunity. I mean, we see that two big things are going to change in the next 10 years. One is uh, financial and governance and other models coming related to blockchain. <clears throat> and second is the changes of all of these models related to climate change. I mean, uh, and especially in the areas where Cardano is active. So we feel that the combination of two will actually is a huge opportunity for Cardano and will make Cardano stronger. Um, and what we basically try to do is we try to um, help proposals related to climate change and impact, which can be on many different subjects, regenerative agriculture, uh, green energy, uh, constructions, <coughs> really many different areas. So we try to make that um, collaborate, how we collaborate, and how we make that important within Catalyst and Cardano, uh, in collaboration with the IOG, the Cardano companies, and so on. So that's really why we think it's so important. And if you think about it, we did an analysis about SDGs and, and, and Catalyst and Cardano, and there is very, very big correlation. Intentionally and unintentionally. And if we think it makes a lot of sense. So intentionally, like there are 26% of <coughs> proposals in Catalyst directly intentionally related to SDGs. And around 96% in total are directly or indirectly. And it makes sense because blockchain is changing so many, you know, it's making it more available for everyone, <coughs> more accessible for everyone, more equal, and especially Cardano focusing on developing countries. So, yeah, so that's kind of, of where we are. And the next step that we are going into this year is also how can we measure the impact on SDGs and climate change? And that I think will be very important uh, as well as the next step this year. Um, yeah, I don't know, Simon, if you want to add something. And, and we, uh, some people said here, we basically started as a challenge team and we became a community and we became a family. I mean, someone mentioned family here from, uh, um, Vinya, you mentioned family, and we really became a family. I mean, we have, it's so inspiring and collaborative and, um, and uh, amazing people trying really to solve uh, key issues uh, in the world, in their communities. Uh, it really became, uh, yeah, like a family. It's incredible. Um, yeah, I think I would also like to add, um, because, the thing uh, Cardanus or IOG is trying to do here is building a new system, right? A new kind of economic system. Uh, and I think it's important that we make that, or that we make sure that that system can solve problems like climate change, which uh, the traditional system just couldn't, or, you know, is really slow to take on. Yeah. So um, last year, uh, we asked a sort of similar question around what is Cardano to everyone. And one of those, uh, are the members of the room who's not here today is a woman from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Charity. And uh, she framed something in a particular way that I think is really, really important here. Is she framed it that, that um, you know, so much of the attitude towards developing countries has been this sort of, in a sense, a hero mentality, aid. We come in, we provide aid, we know the better way of doing things. And her frame was, well, that, that's rubbish. We've got the local knowledge. We've got the um, ability to affect our own needs and affect our own environment. Just give us the tools and permission, in effect, to go off and do it. Right, rather than just coming in with an aid, mental, aid mentality, give us the cash, give us an attitude that says we can help ourselves. Right? And to me, fundamentally, uh, the core reason for a tech, uh, this underlining technology called a blockchain isn't to go off and flip tokens, isn't digital money. 
It's what's referred to as an institutional technology, a technology that enables us to coordinate our activities in a much more finer, granular fashion than a government agency or uh, aid agency has ever enabled us to do before. So it touches on sort of the various things like the uh, sustainability development goals, as Joram pointed out, uh, and Simon pointed out. It's this ability to coordinate ourselves more effectively. Right. And one of those things is changing a few narratives. Um, it there was a really interesting thing with respect to climate change that I brought up. I think I may have mentioned this before, but the idea of where did the carbon footprint came from? Where did that come from? You know, we've got to try and you know, reduce our carbon footprint. It was actually a marketing campaign, much like diamonds are a girl's best friend, or Santa is from Coke or anything else like that. It was actually a marketing campaign by BP, British Petroleum. And it basically, one of the key ideas and behind this was to um, shift responsibility back to um, you know, the consumer, but also remove the ability for people thinking that they can coordinate and act upon by themselves. This was one of the key sort of things behind uh, many of the uh, things like recycling and uh, the carbon footprint um, was uh, so one of the things I like about what Catalyst is doing is showing that we can collaborate and coordinate and work together and share ideas right find out what the local uh, local knowledge what works locally figure out how to um, solve those sort of problems, not locally, but globally. In other words, um, we can think, or we can act locally, but we can think globally. And that is something that Catalyst is showing that we can do, driven around by the sort of ideas of what we can do with the underlying technology. Joram, you had your hand up. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I mean, with everything you said, and I think what was exciting for me, and this is why I came to the blockchain in general and find home in Cardano, is that I worked for a few years for an NGO working on agricultural supply chain in Africa and Indonesia and, and these areas. And I really feel the big challenge for scaling the impact is obviously it has to start locally, but then you have to have transparency and traceability. I mean, right, we hear about hundreds of billions of dollars going into impact projects uh, just in CAP 26 and so on, but where the money is going, what's the impact of the money, all of that is, is really vague today. And, um, and so this is, uh, I think, the big opportunity we have. Uh, work locally and create this transparency of um, interestability of uh, resources and of results. Um, and then I think we will have right, the right tools to, to make the changes we want to change in the world. For local people, consumers can make uh, decisions. Um, people working in the right way can be enumerated um, and so on. So that's really, I think, the opportunity of the blockchain industry to that. Cool. So I was wondering if, uh, Regina, if you could answer the question of what is Catalyst to you? You've been coming along to uh, the Eastern Town Hall sessions a few times. Uh, you're participating as a, a proposer in Fund 7. Uh, what is Catalyst to you? Um, according to me, Catalyst is a very safe uh, space uh, to individuals to bring up their ideas, not only to bring up, but also to grow, to grow in terms of their ideas, in terms of how they're executing their ideas, in terms of collaborating with other partners. You can get partners all over the world in any country that, uh, that you want to, to get partnership. You can get from Indonesia, you can get from anywhere that you think um, you'd want to partner with somebody, you can get that type of partnership um, in Cardano. And also, um, according to, uh, to the challenges, the challenges um, are in the catalyst, you find challenges that you see that you're fitting, and then you go into that specific challenge and execute your, um, your proposal. It, when you do that, 
you grow your community and also in the we also grow the catalyst community and the cardinal ecosystem um all together because that is where maybe something is lacking and you we need we need you we need your presence we need your idea in order for that uh chat that problem um to be solved and when you solve that we move into another into another um into another challenge or into another problem so when we do this we solve something huge together not only yourself and um yeah so according to me i think that's catalyst that's all about oh, thank you regina and Jan always knows when to turn up, you see, as uh, the <laughs> and because of that, I, you know, I, I'm right here, aren't I, Angela? Yeah, he turns up, I've got to ask him the question. <laughs> so the question here, Jan, is uh, what is Catalyst to you? We're trying to explain Catalyst and sort of by capturing people's understanding. What is Catalyst to you? That's a simple and a hard question at the same time, because it depends on where you're coming from. Where I'm coming from, I see Catalyst uh, because initially I didn't know much about uh, blockchain, Cardano and so forth. So my initial thought is Catalyst as a method to extend our dreams, whatever that dreams is, building a dApps, building an event or building uh, something else uh, that you have in mind. But as you go through Catalyst, it isn't, it's not only an empowerment tool, it's also an educational tool about what is the mission of Cardano? What is, what is the community all about? What is how cryptocurrency is actually the least, the smallest part of blockchain Cardano. So that's what I meant about uh, a perspective. And but to get there, the first thing was uh, uh, that uh, everyone should, uh, should do is just enter first. But that also becomes the homework of everyone that's involved. How, when we see the good of Catalyst, when we see the good of Cardano, how do we, uh, how do we export that vision to, to uh, other peoples? And how, how can they also uh, feel what uh, the good that uh, we've been through? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 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 Um, so, uh, does uh, John? I don't know if you're uh, around at all, or you want to uh, uh, talk to, or Dimitri, do you want to say something? Um, uh, you've been in here a couple of times before. You're coming in from Sri Lanka. Uh, what does uh, uh, Catalyst represent to you? <clears throat> well, I got to know about Cardano only in uh, August. Uh, just after the uh, fund six uh, close. Uh, so I couldn't submit a proposal, but I was able to do, uh, I was able to do uh, uh, CA work uh, for fund six um, and uh, got a small quantity of uh, ADA as a result. So I used that in staking this time around and for voting and stuff. Um, but at that point, I realized that I'm very interested in bringing uh, South Asia or Sri Lanka uh, and the entire South Asian region, because I thought that we were not represented at all um, at the time. So then I started working on multiple proposals on Catalyst. So to me, Catalyst is a way of, um, of being able to bring our part of the world, which is heavily populated, but also uh, among the poorest parts of the world to have some level of uh, competitive or a playing field uh, with the rest of the world, as well as opportunities to participate in big projects um, or to develop big projects um, uh, at the same uh, capability as other parts of the world. So for me, it's a big opportunity um, to become part of a community whereby we can improve the lot of our people. Um, so that is one side of it. The other side of it is where I'm able to uh, become collaborating with multiple projects, which otherwise I would have never known about. Uh, using my own skill set of writing, storytelling, uh, creating narratives, um, marketing, and so on. So right now I'm talking to multiple uh, teams that I would have not been able to do uh, if not for Catalyst. So that's another uh, big, uh, uh, you know, great thing about Catalyst that I can say 
projects that I would not be aware of, I'm able to not only be aware of them and also to partner with them in doing particular things, translations and stuff like that. So, um, so that's another uh, big opportunity. So even though I've not, um, even though I've not, um, how do you say, uh, been able to submit proposals as yet for um, for fund six or fund seven. I definitely am going to submit for fund eight, but I have been able to fortunately put a small proposal in for the little fish uh, project. So that's one thing that I have got uh, on the on the cards. Uh, so yeah, that's what Catalyst is. So looking forward to a lot a bigger participation in terms of actual proposals in fund eight. It's excellent. Um, you know, when I was just listening to you talking there and the pattern that is emerging, I think more than anything is what is Catalyst? It's a space to collaborate. Yeah, that's pretty vague, but um, it's a space to collaborate about changing something or introducing new technology in some way, uh, new knowledge in some way, a space to collaborate. And the actual process of Catalyst itself is a knowledge building process. When you do a CA, Dimitri, as you pointed out, you actually learn a bit yourself. Uh, and you, it helps you understand how to put your own proposals together or uh, what you, and fuels other ideas for you saying, hey, actually, hey, this proposal I see here wouldn't uh, work where I'm from, but if I tweak it, if I change it a little bit, then maybe it will, and let's try something else out, right? So in that sense, Catalyst is very much about exactly. seeding and collaboration, yeah, in, in that way, um, as a really kind of- In, uh, in, in fact, uh, in fact uh, I, I just want to share one very interesting thing that I was able to do, right? So because I was, after doing the CA work in Fund 6, so after finishing the work and after that job was done, I was able to contact several of the projects who are uh, doing like multilingual resources and offer them services or projects that needed stories to be written and offer them services. So I only got to know those even though I couldn't submit in fund six because I was doing the CA work. I got exposed to all those different kind of proposals and uh, uh, thereby I was able to uh, really uh, uh collaborate or create opportunities to collaborate so anyway sorry about the noise it's just the fan so we are in a room where it's really really hot so the fan is going so probably that's the metallic noise that you're hearing unless of course it's the video game noise if that's what you're hearing that's my kids playing minecraft so they are going to develop blockchain games and whatnot so once we collaborate with some developers if there are any developers here who want to collaborate on blockchain games to compete with Minecraft, please, please contact me. My kids will definitely be able to uh, contribute how to best make a game. So if I'm not sure which noise you're hearing, but they are, these are the two noises going on here. So anyway, that's uh, what I can say. Uh, so uh, assessments led to collaborations. That's uh, another super chance. Yeah. No, I can I can hear both the fan and the, the uh, keyboards clicking away, and a, a bit of a glee of excitement uh, in terms of what's happening. Um, John here uh, in the room here, but uh, whether he's still uh, actually listening in or not, or busy doing something else, I'm not too sure. But he's been doing uh, blockchain-based games. He's looking into that as well. Uh, so, John, I don't know if uh, yeah, I spoke to John, and I oh, might yeah. do some music yeah. with John as yeah. well for his yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah, so John, since you're here, I'll ask... The, John is the doing the Samurai Ninja game, I remember. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I was interested, I asked the question earlier, and I couldn't, uh, don't know if you heard it or not, uh, but basically you're doing games, uh, you're looking at doing games on uh, block, the blockchain, you're trying to bring in an Asian influence uh, to that, a perspective uh, to the games because that's missing from the gaming industry. So I'm interested from understanding what is Catalyst to you with respect to the gaming industry overall? Overall, yes. So in, oh, let me turn on my camera, sorry. So in Asia, there are uh, small communities that are dedicated to Cardano, but most people are still uh, fixated on the larger blockchain like uh, Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin, these two basically. And 
people are starting to notice Cardano because we are a growing community and we have more tools pushing out and that helps the uh, developer to develop more uh, tools and whatever apps they're not working on. And for me, the Cardano community uh, here has larger influence and has more resources back in Asia. So for me, it makes more sense. Well, I'm physically here as well. Uh, so it makes more sense to collaborate with people here and learn from people. Hope I can give back one day. And yes, that's why I chose the Western community. Uh, so how, how do you think um, Catalyst itself though would uh, uh, fits in to say the gaming industry overall? Um, something mm -hmm. like both, you, you, we've got, you've got a blockchain game, which is one thing, irrespective of what platform it's running on. And so there's dynamics there. Uh, and obviously there's opportunities to raise funding with token drops and those sort of things as well and in-game yeah. assets. Uh, there's also what does Catalyst itself represent in terms of uh, opportunities or approaches to gaming, game development in general? Yes, uh, Catalyst itself, um, they have other proposers that are also working on games. So that's already a very good point that I can collaborate with them. Uh, during my proposal, I mentioned about um, one of my potential game reward while you're playing is to earn other games NFT. So uh, that kind of collaboration sort of help grow the metaverse, which everyone's on about now. And uh, also the, we could, collaborating with like-minded people uh, also help develop it yourself. So Catalyst provide that kind of a platform, which also is like a, also a marketing tool where everyone, when they vote, they get to read what you are doing, what, you, what you're developing sort of sharing the idea. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting point because from a, um, a product management point of view, uh, one of the key things if you're coming along and you're trying to think of developing a product like a game, um, actually getting uh, involved in Catalyst early on and experimenting uh, through proposals and seeing how to develop your message is actually really, really valuable incredibly valuable from a product management point of view. And I know the guys at IAG uh, see it this way as well. I mean, they're getting a huge amount of insight about the overall market for Cardano and what people yeah. are thinking of and how to use it and stuff like that. So that's another aspect of what Catalyst is. Okay. Um, yeah, on, on that sort of front. Um, so I was just wondering, anyone else want to add to what is Cardano before we sort of move on to another topic? Or has that, um, as a point of reference, Jan, uh, uh, um, Juan or... Um, <laughs> is, Shem, uh, Shem. Shem. Uh, how, um, uh, has that sort of helped you understand a little bit? Yeah, I think the explanation from uh, everyone uh, have allowed me to compile what's uh, Catalyst about. Uh, probably I can just look through in some of the links uh, later on and understand deeper. Yeah. Yep. Sure. So, um, and one of the ways in which to get into it is obviously um, what I've found to be really effective in terms of helping people understand what's actually going on is to actually, I flick them a QR code for one of my wallets. Uh, that enables them to vote. And I just say, look, go off and vote. Uh, use this QR code to register. You'll, you'll have a few uh, thousand um, voting points in there. And you can go through and look at um, all the proposals coming through. And the, generally the response that I've got back from people, and I've done this with quite a number of people since the voting's been going on, is they've actually really enjoyed just going through, looking at all the different proposals. Um, and it's a relatively easy, low uh, threshold way to get started to involve with what's actually going on and getting a sense of what the end product of the catalyst process, uh, or at least the sort of iteration is, which is the voting. 
Um, so I find that is to be quite successful. And when they people have cast their votes, I then say to them this, you've just participated in making a decision with a global community where no one knows each other. They could be a, a fictitious pseudo anonymous person as far as you know, uh, voting on a whole lot of proposals on how to allocate some funds to help those proposals succeed or to advance what they're doing. And that's incredibly radical because other ways to actually allocate those have typically been a situation where there is a panelist, you know, an appointed uh, area of experts that come along and decide you know, what is appropriate. And this is actually, we're doing it on a global scale across so many different cultures, across time zones, um, and this whole new space of technology that's enabling this form of a nascent or early form of decentralized governance around how to allocate the funds. And obviously, as we grow, we're also trying to figure out how to actually um, measure success, which is a um, challenge at the moment. So to answer um, Angela's question about how do we go about voting, um, the the approach here for those that haven't part has every how many of you have all participated in voting at least in fund six do you want to put your hands up and the reaction there yeah, I, I obviously have um, several times as everyone else how many of us have actually done that right, right, right. couldn't vote uh, this time because i couldn't get the snapshot okay yeah well one of the things you can always do as i said i i actually uh, give out uh, the QR code to one of my wallets. I've got a wallet specifically set up to do this, uh, which is registered, it's got a small amount of ADA in it, and I just let people go off and vote um, because it's such a good, easy way to introduce the ideas. So what happens in the voting? Angela, do you want to run through what happens? Well, the reason I was asking is because I'm uh, <laughs> not probably good at this. I couldn't explain it to you, but you get to go through all the proposals with the voters tool and pick yes or no on whether you like or like. <laughs> Robert, rescue me. <laughs> okay, let's think about this. Um, how do we make decisions in a global community, right? How, how do we actually go about doing this? And the first thing that we've got to do is figure out, you know, well, which proposals do we fund, right? So the way we do that is, uh, first of all, we group everything into challenges. So that's one aspect, and I can go into what challenges are a little bit more later. But within those challenges, that we then need to get a ranking from one down to 200, if there's 200 proposals in a challenge of 20. Right, we have to get a ranking. Uh, and so the first step in voting is to essentially do what's in Catalyst, it's referred to as approval voting in um, the area that the theoretical area that covers all of this is something called social choice. And um, so what we're doing is approval voting. We're getting a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Okay, so you can go through all your proposals and you can give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's the first step. Um, and that creates a ballot. So, and so for every proposal that you decide to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to goes into the ballot. Um, and uh, so you've actually got three voting options. You've got the thumbs up, the thumbs down, or I don't care, or I don't know about this, so I'm not going to do it. Right, so I can skip over it. Um, you create a ballot, which is like a shopping cart of all your proposals that you're interested in, that you, you think are worthwhile or you think aren't, uh, shouldn't be um, selected at all. And then you can cast your ballot. Okay, so that means you submit your vote and that vote goes on to a side chain called York Minster. Okay. Uh, and when you submit your vote, there's also um, the voting power that you have. Now the voting power at the moment is equal one-to-one -to, -one 
to the amount of ADA that you have in the wallet at the time that it was checked, checkpointed. So there's a, a time just before voting starts where all the wallets that have been registered for voting uh, are checkpointed and they get whatever sitting them. So if there's 2000 ADA sitting in your wallet at that time, then you effectively get uh, 2000 equivalent voting power. And when you cast your ballot, every um, choice that you've made in your ballot, every vote, that thumbs up or thumbs down, gets 2000 ADA as an example, because that's the voting power that I've had. So if I've got a thumbs up, they get a positive um, vote for 2000 ADA. If there's a thumbs down, they get um, 2000 ADA voting them down. So up or down. And that creates a ranking for each of the challenges from 1 to 20 or to 200, depending on how many proposals are in that challenge. Okay. And that's what everyone's doing. They're trying to create a ranking. And then what happens once that ranking is established, the funds for a given challenge are effectively poured in down that ranking, down that ladder. Right. So the top one gets funded, assuming that uh, they don't consume all of the challenge fund. The next one might get funded. The third one might be not have enough left over to be funded, even though it's third, but it's asking for too much. So then the fourth one gets to look in and the third one doesn't get funded. So that's the current model of voting. So when you actually go in and vote through a mobile phone app application, right? Uh, you're then given the ability to do the approval voting. And that's the sort of process that's going on. Obviously, before that, before you can even get into that, you must have registered your wallet uh, on using UROI or uh, using Daedalus. And you must have at least 500 ADA to participate. Uh, and you're given a QR code. You only have to register once for the moment. Um, so uh, a lot of people have registered in Fund 5 can still use the same registration. And you have that QR code, you use that the mobile phone app, you scan the QR code with your mobile phone app, that uh, maps your voting power into the mobile phone wallet, and then you can go ahead and do your voting. And that's how it works. So pushing a few buttons, like a thumbs up and a thumbs down, and then saying vote, and you're participating in a global ecosystem to actually allocate funds and make decisions. It's pretty amazing. But also very, very eloquently simple. explained. Thank you. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit long-winded, I'd say, but uh, there's a lot to it. No, you got well, that. <laughs> <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> That's how it works. Um, so yeah, there's a, uh, that's how you go about doing it. And um, uh, what happens obviously before we even get to the voting phase is uh, everything that happens in the catalyst process itself. So the activities that we've got going on here, the insight phase as we uh, jot down ideas, the uh, proposal phase and the review phase, then we've got the vote, voting phase, and then eventually we have the uh, results revealed. And obviously, uh, for the proposals that do get funded, we then go into the whole, uh, what's referred to as the catalyst coordinator, which is the whole reporting of progress and how we do that, which is still a field which is uh, we're working on. And if anyone's interested in that sort of area, perhaps since Stephen has joined into the room there, he might like to introduce himself and discuss an aspect of what Catalyst Coordinator is and how projects are um, uh, uh, reporting and what's happening there. Maybe when I finish my porridge. No, <laughs> you, you do your porridge, Stephen. You carry on and do your porridge. <laughs> okay, well, I'll hold that question. Stephen's going to come back and answer it after he's had his porridge. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll postpone, I can postpone my porridge for a second. But the, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, okay, well, uh, yeah, um, once you, you're, you're funded, uh, you become what you become, what's part of what used to be called the funded cohort. 
and which is um, now called Catalyst Coordinators for some strange reason. And um, but I tend to think of them as funded proposers. That's, that's what you are. You are. Uh, immediately you're funded, um, there's usually a little short delay and then you get an email um, yeah, which asks for proof of life. And there's a proof of life meeting which um, recently uh, it's been a kind of a mass meeting which everyone's had to turn up and then people had to go around and say who they are, what their project is. Um, and going forward, this is probably going to have to change because there's so many people being funded. Now, once you're funded and you've done your proof of life, you get on with your project and you have to do reporting. And there's two kinds of reporting every month. There's a, a monthly progress report, it's called on the 10th of every month, which is kind of like a casual report. It's like how you're doing, what you've been doing, your achievements, that kind of thing. And then on the 25th of every month, there's something called a KPI report, which is much more quantitative. It's like the numbers that you've done, and that's kind of, again, it, that's very broad at the moment, so it may not relate to your project, but you have to come up with a means of expressing what you do at the moment in numbers. Um, fund release. Fund release, I'm not entirely clear on fund release. I think fund release happens every month, and it's related to the amount of funds that you get. So if you get a small amount, it could all be paid at once, obviously a large amount will be paid in installments every month um so that's does that help answer the questions robert well yeah I, i'm i'm the funding coordinator representative on catalyst circle which is a, a body which represents different uh what well, it seeks to uh, problem sense the community so um and um, the, my contribution has been mainly to set up a frequently asked questions page for the funding coordinators. Cool. Felix, you had your hand up. I think it's important to mention also for many, um, we write proposals in Catalyst and while well, everything is via funding, you're not funded to submit a proposal, right? You are funded to execute then the proposal and the funds you are asking for in the funding request part of your proposal, they will not come in one chart. They are distributed in slides and you have to report each month. There also a lot will change, but I think it's important to mention for, for people, for example, who have proposals where for 60, $70,000 in the in project catalyst, you will not receive the whole chunk at once will receive step by step. This is a simple mechanism to avoid that we fund projects and they simply run away with the money and say, ah, cool, thanks you. <laughs> uh, thanks guys. So don't, do not wonder, but um, also with IoT, if you have a team and you need a certain budget to kick off of the requested funds, you can always negotiate with them a little bit when you have evidence, when you have a real need for the budget to kick off the funded proposal already, they are very open as well, so. Yeah, so that's kind of a picture of the whole process. In a sense, um, the Eastern Town Hall, what you hear at the moment, we front end a lot of what happens in the catalyst process and what's happening um, during it. Then obviously through Ideascale, we've got the whole uh, collaboration uh, component. Then we've got the review and the, the voting. And then we've got all the catalyst coordinator, the activity about what's actually going on. And so that's the whole kind of pipeline that gets uh, iterated on itself as we go along and uh, as we try to figure things out. And um, don't be, what I would say here, is don't be a, pa a passive participant in that activity and in that evolution. You're all invited to actually contribute and build and improve upon what's actually going on uh, through all sorts of different aspects. Um, so that, that's what we do here in the Eastern Town Hall um, as well. We're trying to improve what we're doing in the hope that we actually help the whole community broadly and, uh, and everyone can uh, learn how to figure this stuff out. So uh, one last question I'll have for everyone. Uh, and this is really important for thinking about what Catalyst is and everything else is does anyone have an absolutely definitive idea 
of what how useful this blockchain stuff could be, how useful Catalyst could be, and where the heck what good looks like. Does anyone, can anyone honestly put their hand up and say they do? Yeah, you do? No, you can Okay, I, I want to hear that. I want to hear what good sounds like. What does good sound like? Um, I do not have a definitive idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dimitri, would you like to go? Yeah, sure. So um, one project that we are working on is we are going to uh, set up an NFT project here, uh, 10,000 NFT project of elephants. And that elephant project is basically uh, a part of the revenue earned from that is going to be going towards the human elephant conflict, uh, which basically is where elephants due to, uh, due to people taking over their, uh, their lands Elephants uh, barge in in the nights or whatever on border villages and they stampede because their areas are being uh, reduced. So then people get killed, elephants get killed. Uh, but there are solutions like electrified fences and so on, which can be implemented, but they need funds. So we are going to um, use part of the funds generated through this NFT sale, um, uh, NFT sale. And then we will be uh, buying electrified fences and also coming up with new technologies that people have conceptualized, but perhaps not gone into production. So we'll be working with uh, elephant experts who I know personally, uh, who are on the ground, who are involved in these things and uh, providing them the funds um, through that. And possibly we will conceptualize new ways of using the NFTs to further develop those uh, elephants. Maybe we will have elephants, like specific elephants who have been tagged uh, and given particular ID, IDs. So each of those elephants can be given an NFT and funds generated specifically for them. Maybe tracking where they move and having some sort of way where people who contribute can see what the elephant is doing at any given point of time. So that's one project. So the other project, which I actually have um, given a, a small, um, a small uh, uh, proposal for under the Cardano for climate area, uh, is where we are collecting uh, food from restaurants and we are going to distribute that to, uh, to, to beneficiaries because the food gets thrown at the end of the day and rather than throwing the food, which they have to do, uh, we want to collect that food and give it to orphanages and elders' homes. So I'm part of uh, that on an ongoing basis, but by bringing blockchain into it, we'll be able to both generate funds for continuation of the work as well as create a way where people can uh, receive some rewards for donating food, either through NFTs or some maybe tokens that we will generate under this project. Um, so that is another project that is going. And another small project that we are doing is we collect uh, uh, from slaughterhouses, we collect the waste and we take that waste and we cook it and we convert it into, uh, uh, into uh, what do you call uh, pet food. So this is very high quality pet food, which otherwise would get thrown. And when it gets thrown, it will contribute to the landfill waste. And unlike we'll say uh, vegetable waste, it doesn't biodegrade at all easily. So taking this will reduce heavily on the garbage and the pollution in the landfills. Plus it will uh, enable some street, street dogs and other dogs to, uh, I mean, even my own pets eat it street dogs we give it to um, and they are able to get some nourishment out of it so something that's going to waste becomes something that's productive for uh, other animals as well who otherwise wouldn't get it so like that small projects we are looking at in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, the blockchain so this is giving an opportunity to look at things in a whole different way other different funding mechanisms uh, whereby people can get involved in a project that they like and then they are able contribute to it directly rather than just uh, uh, very broadly not and not knowing where it's going so they contribute very directly and uh, so if they like animals they can you know do participate in the animal project or if they like elephants they can participate in the elephant project so that way people can get involved and and work with us collaborate with us in in uh, you know buying the nfts marketing the nfts you know, contributing to the elephant uh, uh, cause, getting more. I mean, I know for a fact because I was in Africa. I lived in Malawi for about three years. 
So I've been to Luangwa National Park and I know Luangwa dwarfs, uh, you know, any of the parks that we have here in size. But uh, uh, so you have elephant, you know, encroachment issues in Africa as well. So these are things that we can collaborate and work on together. Uh, so that's another way that I'm looking at uh, transformative um, I mean, transformative uh, uh, aspect of blockchain in, in our part of the world. So I just wanted to share these couple of few projects that are, even though it's not part of Fund 7 or uh, Fund 6, um, we are looking at doing it um, subsequently in Fund 8. That's a cool. Uh, very cool. And, and that highlights a point here in terms of like local knowledge, being aware of things that are locally happening and around, such as like the elephant encroachment. I was actually reading an article in The Guardian this morning about that very issue in Sri Lanka of one that's died from plastic from eating uh, uh, yet another one from the uh, open landfalls that are there. Anne, you've got a question, uh, your hand up. Um, I was just thinking about what you asked about the specificity of um, blockchain to different aspects where we are. And um, I don't know why Angela did not talk about the issue of women, um, but we, we, you know, we do talk about the, the whole issue of women and we want to bring it up to raise it, um, especially marginalized uh, women who get completely isolated from all this growth and development that could so benefit them if they had any idea that there was any such thing going on around them. And so creating that uh, platform or opportunity for women, um, especially in areas where the women are still in the 18th century. Um, and, and the question you asked about gaming, um, I had an idea for Ida Mitz, Ada meets Naisula. Naisula is a Maasai girl living in literally an 18th century space. And there is Ada who was in the 18th century, mathematician was able to do something. And can those two relate in a game? Um, can we create some, some sort of an NFT around the culture of these uh, women and these people and, and tell their story in some way? Um, so the underrepresentation of some cultures in the world um, and the rich, the, the and the the richness that those cultures would bring to the world as we know it, as we are making it more global and more available to all of us, we can really enrich each other by just having these exchanges and having these opportunities and raising some of these uh, people. These women, especially in marginalized areas, have an amazing lifestyle that um, would be so interesting to capture and. Um, and see how to relate it even to modern day living and how that can sort of translate in a storytelling, amazing way of combining that and building some sort of a cultural awareness. And even in the NFT space, I think that could be very interesting. So that's one, one thought that I have. It could be vague, but uh, it's a thought that we've been kind of playing around with for a bit now in Fund 7 and considering it for a challenge in Fund 8. That's, that's cool. I was busy typing in the chat and um, I just about closed the room. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so, so there's two kind of notions, different notions of what good, good is in this area. Oh, actually several. Um, and I think the, the broader question that I was asking and probably why Angela didn't bring out woman was because I said something around the lines of definitive what is the definitively what is good. And that the answer to the way I see it is there isn't. There's a lot of, a lot of local situations and everyone def can define good in lots of different ways. And it's, a, uh, it's very dependent upon your local context and all the sort of parameters by which um, a project or a funded proposal is actually working towards is actually really quite broad. Um, we don't, in Catalyst, we don't have a narrow definition of what a good project or good proposal looks like, right? because we're dealing with so many different possibles. The universe of possible is 
really quite large here. And so Dimitri's brought up the idea of elephants and, and uh, various different proposals there about reducing waste and stuff. And, and is quite rightly talking about the fact that um, actually 50% of the population is uh, of this planet is women, if not maybe more or less. Uh, but is that the makeup in this room <laughs> as a point? So why isn't there 50% more women in this room? Why isn't there 50% more women participating in our space? And I think that's a really, really important question that all of us should be asking, right? Um, because so much of the world, um, you know, especially in the technology space, for some reason, um, just take a little historical context, computers were actually women for a long time. It was women that did all the calculations for the Manhattan Project, or the mathematical calculations. It was women that did all the, wrote all the software for the Apollo mission to the moon and did all the calculations and stuff like that. And then somewhere along the way in about the 1980s, uh, PC games came along and we started shooting each other in PC games. <laughs> yeah. And somewhere uh, that transitioned and women felt that they couldn't go into mathematics, uh, engineering, any of the STEM product, uh, STEM communities. And for a large time within, and if you've, as I have participated in the Bitcoin community from its early days, um, it was nasty. It was nasty even to men, let alone to women. So as a woman, I wouldn't want to be in there, right? Um, and so a lot of the sort of stuff in terms of, various different structures and stuff like that. How can we improve access uh, or enable women to lift their horizons and say that they can equally participate would be really an achievement to me personally. Stephen. Yeah, so I, I, was, I, I want to push back a bit on the fact that there's possibilities in catalysts for women because um, uh, it's, it's one thing to say there's possibilities and just to say that and to say that in then that's in theory but in practice are there possibilities um in practice there are only possibilities if they're being taken up <laughs> and if they're not being taken up those possibilities don't exist it's just talk so um really what maybe we should moving on to is um and I, what i really loved about what you were saying Anne, is the spaces of possibility it's kind of like love place she was in an 18th century space and she maybe was paid second fiddle to Charles Babbage. Um, but then now she's coming to her own space, her own recognition, and Ada is named after her. Same with the women you're talking about who live in an 18th century analogue in the present. Um, and then a story could be told. Yes, a story could be told. It's not for us to tell their story. You know, it's their story. You know, and it's, you know, again, theory versus practice versus reality. OK, the challenge is to bring that to that. To, it's not to for us to provide a solution or to solve the problem. It's, it's, it's a sense to how can the, the, the women in those spaces find their, you know, come to prominence, come to vis come to visibility. You know, that's how I see it. So. And I suppose it's not, um, that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> but, yeah, so what I'd like to see is actual projects that are funded in catalysts, <laughs> uh, not talk about projects in, in catalysts. The, the amazing opportunity to listen to you, Stephen, at, um, in your breakout room regarding listening on Wednesday. And I really learned quite a few things. That was a good breakout room. Anyone should go and watch that video. Um, <laughs> and what Stephen was discussing was our ability to listen um, in Project Catalyst. And we've displayed very good listening skills here today. And we are interested in developing better listening skills as we move forward. And so listening to women, listening and voting for proposals made by women. Um, there's the diversity and catalyst one by um, boosting diversity in catalyst by uh, 
<laughs> Felix and Co. I can't remember what they're called now. <laughs> what are they called? I can't hear anyone. Swarm, that, you it, mean? Is that a challenge no. setting? Um, I'll, I'll go away and look it up. And, try and there's and a back. challenge setting. There's two challenge settings, actually, um, regarding Fund 8 and having possibilities for projects for women. Um, one by Al Kebulan Alliance and one by, ugh, I'm terrible at remembering the names, but if you get an opportunity, please vote for those ones. They're, they're very obviously labeled for women. There's um, photos uh, just to conclude that. And, and let us um, bring forward the opportunity to listen to more women because the trap we are in danger of falling into is we are, sitting here creating the rules that are going to function for the next 100 years. We're sitting here creating systems that are going to be relevant for the next few hundred years. We are changing the world and we are using the tools that we've been given to help change the world. If the only people in the meetings are male and if they're usually white, uh, they will make a system that works best for them. And so there's nothing wrong with that, but we've already done that. <laughs> If we could have a system that worked best, better for others, that would be really cool. Can I say something on the subject? Yes, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to say something that's politically incorrect. So, uh, far as I've seen in uh, Catalyst or the Cardano community, there is no <clears throat> discrimination or uh, marginalizing of anybody women or men or anybody um, so in my opinion to create a separate category just for women is actually discrimination against men because it's understandable to need that in a situation where there was discrimination against women or favoration of men but to say women themselves need a special fund just for women is in a sense kind of uh, sexual discrimination reverse in this sense simply because in a community where there is equality, ability for everybody to communicate, vote, vote and do everything equally. So everybody has a chance to propose and, and, and everyone has a chance to, uh, you know, ass assess and everyone has a chance to vote provided they meet certain criteria. Just to say women would have separate cha challenges just for them or special favoration to be given for women-led projects or women-led teams. I don't think that's a good idea. I think every uh, equally, women, men, old, young, you know, whatever, Africa, South Asia, North America, South America, everybody. Uh, I don't think um, this discrimination is going to serve the community. Uh, Dimitri, you've gone mute. Yeah, yeah, I said, I said what I felt. Oh, okay. Uh, because uh, it's it's not going to serve the community. I mean, we should function okay. from a place of equality. Yeah, I I don't see it as discrimination at all. Um, and in fact, uh, yeah, very uh, various uh, things. It's about trying to elevate the opportunities by actually uh, calling out, saying actually we want to do something more specifically in this uh, space. And in many respects, just saying that it's just for women actually gives permission. It, it opens the door a little bit more. And I'm not, I can't necessarily articulate that particularly well. I don't know if uh, uh, Anne or Angela or, or Stephen wanted to push back on that at all um, in any way. I would say it's really just promoting rather than looking at it on the side of discrimination, I would look at it more on the side of promoting inclusivity so that it is um, a more positive way of looking at it, where we are building a bit more inclusion in a space where we tend to see less. Um, and so just giving it, not, not necessarily forever, but a little boost at the beginning to promote some inclusivity. And I think other, other minorities might come in as we go along, but in this particular space, I feel that so there's, there's, a, there's um, inclusivity rather than looking at it as discriminating. That's how I look at it. I would just like to say that um, 
the perception that everything is okay doesn't mean everything is okay. Okay. Um, voices that are heard are not the reality. Definition voices that are not heard are not heard. So how do you know they're not heard? And you do know by, I didn't know this, but when I came to Catholic, I thought, oh yes, it's all this wonderful um, utopia where everyone has got a, an equal fair shot, as you put it. Okay, but how do you know that? And I've discovered, and I'm a man, so it took me a while <laughs> um, to that. No, there are verse voices that are that find it really difficult to get heard. It's not just women, actually, by the way. <laughs> it's actually people in different socioeconomic um, categories who don't have a lot of money, for example, and can't say that in, a, in an environment where the crypto environment is quite aggressive about that kind of thing. It's about people who have different styles of manner. Like, for example, on different, some platforms like social media, there's people who, who can't express themselves in that way. So those people aren't included. So, so, so there's a whole range of people who are not included. I agree. <laughs> so, I agree. I mean, I'm from a region, uh, South Asia, which is not represented and which doesn't get heard, which has not got a single challenge or no one to back it up in terms of voting. So I completely identify with what you're saying in that context. So I'm in agreement with you there, but uh, a regional, uh, you know, what you say is accurate for regions, but I mean, women, it's a vast category. I mean, if, if women are not heard, is it just that women are not speaking out? I don't see anybody blocking the women from speaking out or preventing them from speaking out or silencing them in any way or not having enough of voters. Um, that's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm not yeah. against women by any means, but all I'm saying is, if they are not speaking out, isn't it their own choice not to speak out, or is it somebody actually well, preventing okay, if, them if, from speaking? If, if, if you if you could imagine a group of men you'd known for a while and they weren't speaking out, would you just assume that it's just because they're not really interested in speaking out? Um, I mean, I, I, I to be true, I was just this kind of I was quite similar similar to your views maybe a while ago, but. I, I, and I've spoken to, I mean, it's not just, as I say, it's, I stress, it's not just women, it's actually a kind of uh, style of doing things that isn't, that isn't, and I've, I've had spoken to a lot of people who say they can't, when they do speak out, they are ignored, okay? Um, when they do speak out, their eye, they say something, and then a few minutes later, someone else says the same thing, if it's a man, or if they're aggressive, or more, more assertive, that's where the credit goes. The credit goes doesn't go to the woman or the more person who is less eloquent. Let's put it that way. Um, so a, it's like a pattern of behaviour, <laughs> okay? And I, 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 you know, <laughs> there are all in 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 the world that we have. In my view, there are regional uh, exclusions. You know, where voices are not heard from certain regions. There are socioeconomic exclusions, like people who are not heard because they are they clean toilets or something rather than being a banker, <laughs> you know. And there's 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 kind of what I would call exclusions of styles of communication, you know, like or how different ways of thinking. That's that's all I would say. So I would say there is a need, and and actually that need is expressed by by women, has been expressed by women. You know, so that I've encountered um, to have those space, it, just not even, not even actually to, just to have their own space. For you know, so a man doesn't come along and point out to them that they don't need a space. Really. Um, so I can speak to it from a point of view of uh, being Māori in New Zealand, but I, I won't talk to too long because Mark and Lynn have had their hands up. But um, we've got a similar sort of problem here is that uh, Māori uh, have uh, been colonised by the British, obviously, and caused a lot of problems over the last 100 years or so. Uh, and... And uh, now there's a sort of, over the last few decades, there's been an attempt to actually redress all of those. And uh, I mean, the details is the idea that the Crown should be a partner with Māori. And um, there's a lot of pushback on that, saying, oh, you're doing all the special things for Māori. And the, uh, the, the reality is that um, 
that we as um, a culture and stuff like that were marginalized for a long, long time. And so a lot of people in that community don't actually know uh, or associate with being Māori anymore. And all of a sudden, when they can see people that look like them, act like them, talk like them, whatever, uh, or identify with being Māori, it actually is a really, really strong enabler. It lifts them up and it helps them all out. So in a similar vein, if you want to bring more women into uh, our Kadana community, yes, there's nothing inherently stopping them, but often is a bar barrier of stopping by saying, hey, I can't see any other women around. It could be that simple. So maybe I shouldn't go in there. And obviously Anne and um, Angela can speak far more to that, that sense and that feeling than any of us can as men. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think it is, it is um, more, Dimitri, it is not so much, uh, I don't, I'm not talking from a point of feeling discriminated against or anything like that. It is more um, creating a, or having a way in which there is um, more participation, okay? So there's a bit of under-representation. And so, not a bit, but there's quite a bit of under-representation. So can we lift the representation? so that there is uh, some sort of, um, um, yeah, representation, basically. I think that's the word I, I just wanted to say. So, yeah. so that it's not so much mm -hmm. a discrimination. For this community, I don't think the issue would be discrimination. Um, I think the issue here would be including for more participation. And so that there is, um, there is um, the, the, the community becomes richer and more balanced. I think that would help the community to become richer. Yeah, that's that's what I like. Yes. Richer, ri ri richer in what it's actually doing. I like that. Um, Mark, you had your hand up. I know you've taken it down. Did you want to actually say anything or uh, pass it um, along? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just very quickly. Um, I don't think catalyst would look uh, very similar to what it is like today. Like in the next couple of years, you know. For the meantime, because we're just building systems for governance and manage, management and processes, it's more skewed towards men because that's the tech side. But in the next couple of years, like four or five years, when all of these systems are all built out, then Catalyst would be more like social, environmental or crisis prevention and things like that. It, be, it will be more skewed towards women because we've actually... Um, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, this is, uh, sorted out the barrier for tech. And it, I, I don't think it's more to do with discrimination of the women, really. I think it's just more uh, the demographics of you know, this early stage of the catalyst. Yeah, so that would tie in with what Anne was saying in terms of about bringing the rich and the spec in. We've got to try and skew the... Uh, demographics more broadly is a, is a good objective. Uh, Lynn, you've got your hand up there. Uh, yes, that's me, thank you. Can I ask? Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, you go ahead. If I could ask Anne, uh, yeah, if I could ask Anne or Angela, since you all are representing, or uh, could represent women's thoughts, do, um, uh, how would you say that, no, uh, I want to how would you say that catalyst um, or women or what is making women not participate thus far that much in catalyst? I mean, we've had six or seven funds. Uh, what would be keeping women away from it? Is it lack of awareness of catalyst or lack of the technical skills or what is it? May I answer you after Lynn? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Um, okay. Uh, let, let me go to, let me translate uh, Angela view, I said a view in another hundred years from my own to, to my understanding. Yeah? So what Angela say that at the moment, you see that 10 of us, you see 10 of us, so 20% of women, okay, just assume that 20%, see that two over 10 is 20%. So what I, what I translate her view into the way that more, um, that way and say that we translate, I'm, I'm translating it and I put it in the way that how can we have more uh, engagement from all the gender, 
we just put it that gender because now because you know that way I'm come from we we don't care about gender you know so I'm saying more women put it that way so the way the way I understand from what um, Angela say is what if we have more women into the current challenge the current proposal and the current CA to build and to have a different view or additional view in this group of whatever white, a group of white men, whatever that in case, I mean, if we put it that way, okay? So we have a more diversity in terms of who built the proposal, who run that and who give an idea for a longer view, but not into the dis discrimination, but in terms of building. So example, now we have 20, 20%. Um, so you can see that a lot of program for women. Why is that? What sort of you need to have? Okay, if you're from a cybersecurity, how many percentage of student in cybersecurity is female? I can tell on you that it is my twenty year experience. Not much. Not much in my class right now. Two student out of twenty. That's one percent. And every every cybersecurity hack in hackathon, I have to work so hard to get a female student in. Why do we do that for? Because there is a half of us is female. So in next whatever year in the future, say 100 years along the way with Cardano, so if there is a more China woman involved to write the proposal, the delivery proposal, it gives us a balance, the different view together than you know majority of us. That's what I in, in, interpret the uh, Angela and, and and how we group, we add more voice as well. It's not just uh, all of us here, you know, the musculars like most of us, but it's more feminine. <laughs> that what I uh, that what I see. So I support if Angela say, Lin, what about me and you? Rather propose or how to engage more women around the around the planet for next for night. I'm the first hand on. I will put all my time to write into that to get how they engage in from writing the wallet from delivery Bluetooth, from our debt, uh, from whatever. I, I, I would, my hand will first, Angela. I promise, I deliver it even I don't have time. I'm done, thank you. So that's uh, quite, a, quite a discussion you started there, Dimitri. <laughs> um, we could go on. I would like to acknowledge that we have two minutes. Are we stopping the meeting here or am I, am I going in? You can carry on for a little bit longer, but uh, yeah, I, I I don't want personally don't want to go beyond the the, the too much longer because um, it is reaching midnight here. So <laughs> I'd like to go to sleep. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Lee. In terms of the percentages, I think percentages put it in a very clear way. Um, if, a, if, if a decision is made by 98 or 99% men, uh, that decision works for 98 to 99% of men. Uh, that decision does not necessarily take in a different perspective. Um, that decision does not necessarily open up new possibilities for how we as societies could function. Um, Robert said it was from the 1980s in terms of computer science, um, but I would say, you know, decisions made by patriarchal societies have brought us to a point uh, now where a lot is being said about the position of women. And a lot is being said in multiple um, places, uh, institutions in multiple uh, types of, uh, even, even, even um, for example, in Kenya, we really, really struggle to have women being accepted into parliament um, and being accepted into decision-making places. Now, That is problematic because a room that is equally men and women brings many, many, many different thoughts and many, many uh, perspectives. Perspectives is what I'm trying to say. And you may have your perspective, but there's a whole bunch of people that we're not listening to as, as we, we heard from Stephen. 
Um, I have many, many thoughts, but the idea that 98% of the people making a decision could possibly be being discriminated against, I have to disagree with that, just on the mathematics. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me that there could be discrimination against the majority. The majority, just by being in the majority, are in power. So, yeah, this is uh, actually something I'm doing, digging in quite a bit, or we'll, we'll be digging, digging in quite a bit, uh, because um, I'll be doing some work with our Ministry of Culture and Heritage here, uh, building something on Kadano uh, this coming year. And uh, this topic of uh, representing different perspectives and bringing richness into the digital environment in a way that is respectful um, is going to come up a lot in, in this particular project work. And I find it quite fascinating, fascinating because it's so interesting. It's um, interesting because it challenges you to think uh, or, or to use the, the terms that have been put out here to listen and to challenge your own perspectives on how you view the world and what how things are done. And this is one of the th reasons why I like the Eastern Town Hall so much, right? Is because we've got a richness of viewpoints. Um, we're coming in from all sorts of different countries, all different upbringing, upbringing uh, and uh, different situations and different knowledges. And to me, that's always a, a lovely sort of mix of where you know, we can learn so much and challenge what we're doing. And that's that's what I find interesting. So that's that idea that Anne was bringing across in terms of richness is important. And the other idea that Angela is bringing about is that ultimately if the decisions are made by a group, then it's always going to favor that particular group. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's male, female, black or white or Asian or you know, Western, it's always going to kind of favor that point of view because that's the viewpoint in which you're immersed in. And so um, diversity, uh -huh. diversity sure. helps us uh, lift our eyes above and look around and challenge our own mindsets. And that's what I like about it. Yeah, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Robert. I'm gonna... Uh, um, Anne's point about richness really resonates with me and I have to say to Dimitri it's not about um, it's, it's also about different dimensions of experience okay and divergent views I don't want everyone to agree <laughs> if everyone agrees it's, the world would be a really boring place you know and we wouldn't really you know disagreement is fundamental and and you know we all have our different life experiences our different cultures where we come from and we're, what i'm really excited about in terms of how we can innovate in cardano is not to say oh i have to change and everyone has to be the same you know or we have to join the old what are sometimes called the old cult culture wars on twitter and stuff like that maybe we can deal with these things differently and maybe you know, there maybe it's about spaces for ourselves, you know, creating spaces for ourselves, like right? where, you know, where we we consider we can represent ourselves, but then you know, and then we can bring and also forums like this is why Eastern Town was so great because there was other forums, particularly in the crypto space, which are very confrontational. And here, I hope that people can, and I'm sure people do actually, people disagree and are able to civilly talk to each other about that, and that's really important. Totally agree with that um, on, on many fronts. So anyway, uh, it's had two hours since we've been going um, and uh, it is 12 o'clock for me. <laughs> and uh, um, so uh, do you wish to carry on for a little bit longer or would you like to wrap it up? Um, easy with, I could probably go for about another 15 minutes and then I'll uh, start to fade. <laughs> 
so it's up to you whether we call it a, call it quits for the night and uh, come back in two weeks' time to continue the conversation. Uh, but what I will say is that the idea of richness, the idea of bringing in diversity, uh, and the idea of uh, challenging your own thinking and stuff like that, to me, is a, a good way of trying to answer what good is. Yeah. If we can do that, then uh, we're succeeding because that fulfills the idea of being sort of collaborative and learning and stuff like that. So do people want to carry on for a little bit longer or shall we call it a, a evening on my side of things? Your call. Anyone? Let's feel sorry for New Zealand. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you poor thing. Like, there's no one, there's no one, like, further out than you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. On the, uh, on the traditional map, you are in the center of your own, your own world. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've got this massive moat between us and everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so with that, uh, I think uh, we'll wrap it up and uh, carry on. And thank you for the delightful conversation, everyone. It's been lovely. And I hope, Juan, you learned a, a chunk of that and everyone else did actually picked up uh, in terms of other people's voices. I think it's really, really important. Um, and, oh, that's, I was actually gonna say one thing is, um, I just remembered, is that actually one of the ways in which we define the direction or a platform or doing things is through the challenges. The challenges are the most important thing. Uh, inside a catalyst and how we define those. And um, so setting challenges for trying to bring in diversity, say more women and stuff, are, is a way of opening that door up. But it could just as be easily to have a challenge for doing things for pets, if we wanted to. Because I see Stephen's cat. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's up to Robert, us Robert, before define. we go, could I just yeah. plug my proposals? Could I just plug my proposals before go we it. go? Because yeah, there go is a small it. voting. Uh, so Little Fish has got a small challenge for a thousand ADA uh, as their first round of direct funding. Now I've put two proposals in. So there is a process by which you can register to vote. And I would uh, ask all you guys, please to vote for either the uh, slaughter waste to pet food for street dogs or the collection of uh, food distribution for giving to orphanages and uh, elders homes and such like street people the homeless please register with little fish and vote for it because it's coming up this week thank you yeah if you could drop the drop, being drop, annoying. <laughs> if you could drop the links into the chat there um i know that sound stopped being annoying all too well that's a kid getting frustrated by his older yeah. younger brother playing a computer game <laughs> um so if you throw throw the links in there, that would be great. Uh, but with that, uh, I will see you and talk to you again next week. Hope to see you all in a couple of weeks' time again. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Hello, Robert. Did you're muted? Yeah, I am. I was just wondering what was going on. So, because I'm the host, so I was going to uh, quit. Have you guys finished good. up? You've finished yep. up, have you? Yep. Sure. yep. Okay. Well, okay. I'll close the meeting and uh, get all the recordings and stuff like that. That's good. Awesome. Okay. How did it go anyway? It went well, it went well. So we changed things up and I'm, I'm taking more of a back seat. I'm letting uh, certain individuals take the front seat. So yeah, it went well. Excellent. I'll probably try to um, share some ideas next Monday as usual. 
<laughs> so good. be looking forward to me being uh, overly talkative. That's cool. I like that. I like <laughs> that. I do. So <laughs> the less I can say, the better. <laughs> That, that's my metric of success, at least I can say the better. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Right here. We will catch up with you on Monday. Uh, we'll awesome. Right here. Take care, Robert. Bye. Have a happy too. weekend. Yeah. Well done. See you later. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. um, just hi there, everyone. I'm going to finish up everything. So I'll just close this meeting down. Okay. Nice to meet you all.